family gathering in Utah. It's a little bit like a family gathering in a family with fertility problems, but you know, we have big families there. Uh, speaking of families, I want to tell you a little bit of, uh, of a story. My son James, a few years ago, was dating this girl named Cassie. Love Cassie. Cassie's beautiful. Cassie's a musician. Cassie knew nothing about politics. She knew nothing about what James's father does for a living, and we were fine with her not knowing that. I think she uh, thought it was a carnival ride operator. But at some point, when Cassie realized that it was getting serious, she figured out what I do for a living. She realized, oh my gosh, I have no idea what I am politically. So naturally, she went online and took a quiz. So she approached James. Uh, she wasn't sure how he'd react to the news of what she was. She said, James, I took the quiz, and I found out what I am politically. She was very nervous, and he said, well, well what are you? She said, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. And James was so relieved, so relieved, and he said, that's great, that's okay, that's pretty much what we are, we're just not quite pure enough to be that, but you know, we're going to agree a lot of the time. But here's what happened, James and Cassie, it was fate, they got married. And uh, just about five weeks ago, they had a baby, her name is Daisy, and she's beautiful. So, and it worked out well, this combination between my constitutional conservative son and my libertarian daughter-in-law, they produced a perfect offspring. I was holding Daisy, she's like six weeks old now, just an hour ago before I got here. It's only a true story, true story. She looks up at me, barely old enough to smile, and she says, Grandpa, you've got to introduce it next week. I didn't know she could talk. Just learn how to smile. And I said, introduce what? And she said, and the Fed!
You're going to have an opportunity to hear from someone. I know you're divided on this person, but I've worked with them, and I want to tell you about where Donald Trump agrees with you on some things, some serious things. Do you know who does like? You know who does like the central bank digital currency? Donald Trump, and he's promised to act. After being elected, elected in, in 2016, 2016, a lot of people were worried about, about what he'd do with wars. And, and you know what? I, I, I was with him on countless occasions. occasions. I don't, I don't know if you know this, this but I've got, got a lot of colleagues who are kind of fond of war. Some of those colleagues and some, some of the people, of the people in this sort of deep state crowd wanted him to go into war. And I saw him, to his great credit, resist that over and over and over again. And I heard him tell him. And he was being encouraged to do this. He was tired of making those phone calls to husbands, fathers, parents, as somebody, a loved one, had died in another undeclared war. He pushed back on that. Donald Trump was also someone who took down federal regulations. He understood something. He understood something. That, you know, I keep these two stacks of documents in my office. One stack is a few inches tall, sometimes about this tall at the most. It's the, uh, uh, the bills passed, passed by Congress in the last year. It's probably, you know, 10, 11 inches too many, but it's, it's only a few hundred to a few thousand pages per each year. Those are the laws passed by Congress in the last year. There's another stack 13 feet tall, 100,000 pages long. That consists of laws made by unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. Is that just? My version of Article 1, Section 7 says that you cannot make a federal law without the House and the Senate, and the Senate passing, passing the same law, presenting it to the president and having him sign it into law. Without that, there is no federal law. Do you know who recognizes that and wants to reverse this trend? Donald Trump! In a few minutes. If you want to take my word for him, hear it from him. Let me tell you just a couple of things about him personally that you might not know. I don't know about you, but I love the Constitution. I dream about the Constitution. I have a pair of Nike basketball shoes with Article 1, Section 8 inscribed on the back, and I like it. I want to tell you a story about, about Donald Trump and the Constitution. One day I was in, in the Oval Office with him. We talked about all sorts of issues, all kinds of issues. Out of the clear blue, he asked me the nerdiest, the wonkiest constitutional question about the intersection of the Constitution and the Senate rules that I had ever imagined. Uh, I'm going to imitate him for here for you. I, President Trump, I apologize in advance if you're offended by this, but there's no way I can communicate the full effect of what I'm doing in his voice. So, here's what he said. Mike, what would happen if somebody came onto the Senate floor and they objected based on the absence of a quorum while the Senate was in a pro forma session? I won't give you the whole thing. It was really long, it was complicated, and I said, sir, I could answer that question, it'd probably take me a few hours. I would have to consult a few Senate rules experts and a couple of other lawyers, but I think I can get you the answer. That's okay, I got time, go talk to Johnny. So I found this guy, Johnny. We assembled the necessary lawyers, Senate rules experts took us several hours. By the time we got it done, I watched Johnny through this like 10, 12 step uh, answer. And I said, you've got this, and all of a sudden he said, no, 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 I, you're gonna have to come with me to explain it, I can't do it. So I went back to the Oval Office with him, thought he probably uh, left by now, it was dark. Walked in, he was on the edge of his, of his seat. Oh, come on in, thanks, Kellyanne Meadows. You know, he, he, he rallied the step. So I gave him the answer to this question, it was complicated, and uh, at the end of it, he goes, you know, Mike, when the rest of us were 16, we were out chasing girls, doing crazy stuff. And then he gets this really pained look on his face. But then I think about you at that age. And you're not doing that, Mike. You're at home sitting at a desk and you're studying the, the Senate rules and the Constitution. Am I right? And I said, well, I did like girls at that age, but yes, you're, you're not far off. I was doing that stuff. And he goes, I knew it, I knew it. And then he turned to his staff assembled and he said, and yet he has a beautiful wife. I don't know how he did it. Look, my message 
is this. The federal government has become too big and too expensive because it's doing crap it was never intended to do. We have been on a collision course with socialism since April 12, 1937, the day the Supreme Court of the United States bastardized the Commerce Clause, and by so doing, they almost destroyed the vertical protection we call federalism. No sooner had that happened that Congress panicked over its newfound authority over labor, manufacturing, agriculture, mining, health, safety, welfare, and we stopped passing laws and we started delegating the lawmaking power. The result of all this has been really bad for the American people. It's been good only for a few people in Washington, D.C., home to eight of the ten wealthiest counties in America. We've got to return that power back where it belongs to the people. So I'm here to ask you, don't settle for big government. Expect constitutional government. Demand that we restore federalism and separation of powers. Donald Trump may not agree with you on everything, but I can tell you, he will agree with you a whole hell of a lot more than that nutball in the White House or anybody else on the ticket. I encourage you to support Donald Trump, restore the Constitution.